you have your Bibles today, open them up to the book of Genesis, chapter number 15. Genesis 15. We're going through a series on what we're calling it faith and blessing. Faith and blessing. Now, the only problem with going through a series like this is um, you hear a sermon and you say, wow, that's a, that's a good sermon. It's kind of what you expected to hear uh, when someone talks about faith. You know, we, we talk a lot about it. And, and we expect, you know, that those are the good and the right things. But uh, understand that it's not just uh, for church talk. It's real life stuff. And we need to, uh, it's more, it, it helps you with all the problems of life. It's not just church. It's, it's, a, it's what can we understand from a holy God to help us in all the difficulties that we face. That there is a God you know, sometimes we look at the sinful world and we don't think God's doing a very good job. And, and we say, Lord, if, if this, this is out of hand, look at all these things that are going on. But because we don't understand, and our, our little finite mind uh, can only see things very dimly when we look at things through circumstances. But, but we have a God who re- loves us. We have a God who redeems us. We have a God who helps us. We have a God who is there for us. He, we are not alone that he is there with us. So if you would, in honor of uh, God's word, would you stand with us? Let's learn what Abraham learned about this term called faith. The father of our faith, Abraham. We're going to learn exactly when that comes to be. Genesis chapter 15, verse number 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your exceedingly great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me? Seeing I go childless in the air of my house as Eleazar of Damascus. Then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house, one bo- um, indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look now towards heaven. And count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And then verse 6. I believe it may be one of the most powerful verses in all the Bible, if not the most powerful verse in the Bible. Most definitely, most likely the most powerful verse in the Old Testament. It changed everything. Look in verse number 6. And he, that is Abram, believed in the Lord. And he, that is God, counted it to him or accounted it to him for righteousness. He believed in the Lord. And God counted it to him for righteousness. Let's pray. Father, all preaching is vain if it is not your word that is amplified by your spirit to our hearts. Father, may it not be just as sounding brass or clanging cymbals. But Lord, your word of love. Lord, how great that you are that you would love us the way that you do. And with what an exceeding wonderful love that it is. Lord, thank thank you for making it possible for a holy God to know sinful man. Thank you, Lord, for making a way, one that we could not do, to cross a cavern that we could not reach. Lord, there are as many attempts as religion as people trying to reach heaven. But Lord, thank you that you sent Christ to reach us. Lord, Abram had questions, but you proclaimed greatness of who you are and who we are as we walk with you. And I pray that today, in the midst of this circumstance of the world, in the midst of this pandemic, in in the midst of so much fear and uncertainty, Lord, that you would ring a true sound to our hearts. Father, draw us to yourself. Lord, may people hear the word of God, the salvation call. And for those that you are speaking to, may they respond and ask you to come into their heart and life and to save them and be their Lord and Savior forevermore. Father, we thank you for those that have come, that are in the building today. We thank you for those that are watching online. 
You're the God of all, the Lord of hosts. And Lord, be with us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. I love that in this time in Abraham's life, God reaches out to him. Abraham didn't even really have to worry about that. God said, I have a word for you. And at the right time, God comes and reveals himself to Abram. Now, understand in chapter 14, Abram had been thrust into a circumstance. We see Lot was taken. There were these four kings who came in, and they were uh, trying to show their authority. And they came in, and they took uh, Lot and his family and all those people away. So Abram took his 318 trained servants, went out and reached out, found them, initiated the battle, began to win, and chased the enemy 200 miles to, to get Lot and his family and all that back. God was with him every step of the way, but it finds it intriguing that after that victory, when, when, when Abram comes back home, that he worships the Lord. Melchizedek's there, and he brings a tithe of offering and praise and, and, and to glory to God, to give God his first. And, and at that point, we don't know the time frame between chapter 14 and chapter 15, but, but after God had already come through to him, God said, there's something else you need to see and know and understand. And in those circumstances, he comes to him and says, Abram, and, and by the way, he says here in verse 1, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram. This is the first time you find that phrase in Scripture. The word of the Lord. God speaks. God speaks to us. In the Old Testament, he would speak through prophets and seers. They would be called seers. Later on, they would be through Jesus Christ and then through his word. And, and, and this is where we can see and know. But he comes to Abram in a vision. And he brings God's word to him in a vision. You know, we need to hear not about God. We need to hear from God. We need to have our hearts open that God loves you and that God cares for you, and God wants to speak to you personally. And God does that in many ways. He does it through sermons. He does it through songs. He, he does it through the, the written word. He, he does it through a, something you see on a coffee mug, something you hear on TV or on the radio or you're in a conversation with someone. There are things that can come, and then the Holy Spirit meets us there, and he speaks to us. And he can say more in seconds than we could ever strive to understand in a lifetime. I remember one time when, after I, I had uh, accepted God's call to, to be a preacher, I was driving from one uh, part of the state to another where my parents were, and I was going to tell my parents that uh, God had called me and I was going to accept and I was going to be a preacher. I mean, catch them off guard, right? And I remember going at a certain place and, and stopping at a red light. And, and nothing I was looking for, but God spoke. And in the time frame from it being red to turning green, I don't know how... In a matter of seconds, God said things to me then that I still remember to this day. Listen to me. I still remember how I felt in seconds that I could not make happen. But, but God loved me, and God knew that I needed a further word and spoke to me then. And I still feel the ramifications of what God did in that moment. We need to understand that God loves us and God will reach out to him and we need to be open to that. And he comes to Abram and says these words, I am your shield. And, and the personal pronoun, pronoun is in the emphatic sense. In other words, he is saying to him, I'm yours. Now I am the I am God that he would say to Moses later on. Moses would say, who, are, who shall I say sent me? I am that I am. But he's saying, I am your shield. Now, obviously, a shield is one that, that safeguards you, that protects you, that keeps the, the things of this world from attacking you and hurting you. We need to understand that it's not us. It's God that is there for us. And God can be there, and God will protect you. And, and Abram, God was already there, but he just wanted him to know. Abram, I'm with you. I'm there for you to protect you. I'm there for you that no matter what this world brings against you. Haven't we had some uncertainty? 
Haven't we been filled with fear? Haven't we worried a little bit more than normal? 2020 is going to go down in my lifetime as one of those years. We're going to be challenged on every point. And God's going to say to us, hey, guys, just understand this and know I'm there for you. And you may say that this is overwhelming and you don't have any answers and you don't know what's coming. He is saying, I am there to protect you. I am your shield personally for you. I am your reward, <clears throat> but I'm your great reward. As a matter of fact, I am your exceedingly great reward, more than you could ever know otherwise. I want to tell you this. When we get to heaven one day, oh, how wonderful it's going to be. But we're not going to have to have a sun for the light of the day and the moon for the light of night because we'll have Christ. Every moment, every second of all eternity, we're going to know what we have because of Christ. Where we stand with Him, what He has done for us, the riches. When we look around at all that, that is the heir of God that we become joint heirs with Christ of, all the bounty that we do not deserve, the grace that's bestowed upon us, we're going to know that we have them because of the riches of Christ. He is saying He is our reward, exceedingly great reward that it is. Abraham probably said, okay then. But he said, Lord, I got a problem. And in verse 2, he said, Lord God, the word God there is Jehovah. But once again, the first time you'll see this in Scripture, the word Lord, Adonai, my personal Lord, my master, the one that I bow to. Now he is saying to him, you are my God, the one true God. And you are my Lord, you are my Adonai. But understand, Lord, what will you give me? He's not saying, what am I supposed to do? But Lord, what are you going to do for me? Now he's basing this on what God had already promised him in Genesis 12. Y'all remember the I wills? He comes to Abram and said, I will make you a great nation. I will, I will. Five times he said those words, I will. Abram is just sitting back and saying, okay, God, you're my guard. You're my shield. You're my exceedingly great reward. But, but Lord, I've got this problem. You said that you were going to do something, but I haven't seen the results of it. He says, seeing I go childless in the air of my house is Ele Eleazar of Damascus. He said, you're telling me that you're going to make of me a mighty nation, but I'm telling you, I don't have an heir. If he's going to be the heir, fine, great, wonderful, but, but I, I don't have an heir. Look what he says in verse 3. Look, you have given me no offspring. When I look at that, I, I look, sometimes, have y'all ever felt like you're the one that came up short? God, you're great, but I made the mistake. I let you down. Abram's not coming like that. That's healthy. Now, he's got a question, and it's okay to have questions. It's okay, it's okay to say, I don't understand fully. But he's not blaming himself. He says uh, in verse 2, what will you give me? In verse 3, he said, he said, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. How can I be a nation? I'm 90. Have you looked at Sarah? Things aren't looking too good. You're going to give us a child? Really? I don't see it coming. We've been trying, but nothing has come of it. Lord, what am I supposed to do? How can I go forward with this promise? You've done nothing. And then God answers back. Look in verse 4. He said to him, this one shall not be your heir but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. We'll learn more about that when we get to chapter 16, right? But he says, no, no, Eleazar, good guy, but that's not your heir. He said, I'm going to do something else for him. And he said, he took him outside. He took him outside and he said, look up. Could you imagine in that place where they were, in the, we would say in the, the clear of the night, no street lamps, nothing to distort. He looks up and sees all the stars in heaven. 
God says to him there, uh, look now toward heaven. I pray that we do that. I pray that we can look beyond our circumstances and see the Lord of glory, the Lord in heaven. He said, uh, count the stars if you're able to number them. Now, he knew he couldn't. And then he said to him, so shall your descendants be. He's saying, I'm going to reiterate this to you. I, I said I was going to make you in a great nation. Abram, I'm going to do it. You say you can't. I'm going to tell you I can. Look at all those stars that are being held in glory. Look at the different sizes of them. Some are big, some are little. Some look close, some look far away. Some sparkle, maybe a little brighter than the others, but just understand all of them out there are mine. I hold them in place. I'm the God of all that. But, but by the way, Abram, personally, your offspring, your descendants, will be far greater from all those things that you see up there. And Abram said, Okay, Lord. Okay, Lord. I, I, Y'all look up here. I, I tell you, it's, uh, it's one of the greatest theological points when God speaks and in our spirit we say, Amen. Okay. The word Amen means it is right, so be it. We hear God. And somehow, we believe. We take him at his word. And by faith, we can see through the darkness to see his light. We can see through the struggles to see his love. We can see past our sins and find his mercy. We can see past our failures and find his redemption and his love. God reaches out, as undeserving as we are, and he says, I'm there. You don't have to worry about these things. I'll be your shield. You don't have to worry about, about what's going to happen. or what's, I'll be your exceedingly great reward. I'll be the reward for you. You don't think I can make you a nation? Look at the stars. I can, I'm God. I can do all. And Abraham said, okay. Okay. When I was a child, God began to move on my spirit. People say, how do you know there's a God? When he moves on your spirit, you'll know. Did you hear his voice? Never heard it audibly, but my goodness, he could grab a hold of me and pull. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Stubborn, hard-headed that I am, I know that's hard for y'all to believe. I began to listen. God began to woo me to himself. I wished I could say that the first time I heard his voice, the first time that that tender calling to move from my sin to his holiness. I wish I could tell you that I just said, yes, absolutely, God, I believe. But it was more than that. It was more than that. But I remember the day, I can picture it in my mind even now. I remember where I was. I remember how I felt. I felt like I was going to explode. It was a perfect circumstances of all these things coming together for God to tenderly show me himself, to move me past my fear, to, to, re to put faith within me, and I reacted upon it. Now, it says in verse 6, the most powerful verse in the Old Testament. By the way, Paul quoted it in Romans chapter 4 and in Galatians chapter 3. James, the brother of Jesus, who, who became really the first leader of the church in Jerusalem there, didn't even believe in Jesus as the Savior until after he saw the resurrected one. In, in James chapter 2, in defining salvation, how, how you receive salvation, he quotes this same verse. 
Look what it happened in Abraham's life. Look what it says there in verse 6. He believed in the Lord, and God counted it to him for righteousness. He believed in the Lord. Anybody ever heard of John 3, 16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that what? Whosoever what? In him shall not perish, but have what? Hold on. John 3, 16. That fundamental verse, foundational verse, says, whosoever believeth in him. When my kids were small, they, they heard a lot of preaching. I mean, they, they were there Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. I probably gave it to them Thursday afternoon. They probably heard more sermons from me than you'd ever wanted to hear in a lifetime. If you ask those kids, who is Jesus? They could say, that's God's son. What did Jesus do? He left heaven to come to earth. He lived a sinless life. He preached goodness. He showed the people the way to God. But they took him and they crucified him on the cross of Calvary and he died. They put him in a tomb. But on Resurrection Sunday, he rose again. They could tell you the facts. They could tell you the facts. But James chapter 2 also says, four verses before James quotes Genesis 15, verse 6. Four verses before that, it says, do you believe these things? Even the demons believe them and tremble. It's not an ascent of facts. It's faith in your heart. Faith sees, sees through the muddling. Faith sees through the circumstances. Faith sees through and finds a God of glory who is the all-powerful one who loves us individually and comes for us and extends salvation. And we say, you know what? Amen. Yes, sir. I know I have sinned, and Lord, I turn my back on that. And I know what you did for me. And Lord, I, I reach out my hand. I want to receive that. Come into my heart and save me. The problem is, where is our faith? Y'all ever heard of seals? Seals. There is a, a Dr. Henry Cloud. He's a Christian psychologist, and he works with, a, matter of fact, he's been on the radio for years, but he's also worked with corporations, and one of the groups that he works with are the Navy SEALs. And have y'all ever heard this statement that when a person goes through the difficult, the most difficult circumstances, that they will rise to the occasion? and that they'll be pushed beyond limits that they thought that they could never reach otherwise? That's what they say about seals. Matter of fact, they, they put seals through what is called BUDS. Basic underwater demolition seal training. Y'all ever heard about Hell Week? All that they put them through? Won't let them sleep, make them do all the... And out in the cold water, hypothermia swimming these huge long distances why to get them prepared for what they're supposed to do things like putting them up in a plane at some crazy altitude and they jump out of a plane and then they hit the water just right and, and they're in some cold water in some distant land and then when they get in the water they they change into their battle fatigues underwater then they go down to the bottom of the ocean and take a power nap who in the world would do such a thing? And they take a power nap, and then they get up, and they go to some ship in the dark of the night, and they take that ship from the enemy. That's what they're trained to do. But Henry Cloud says this thing of, of you're put in the circumstances, and, and the best of you will come out, and you'll go to places that you could have never gone otherwise. He says, untrue, untrue. Working with them, this is what he concludes. You won't push through to greater heights, but you'll go to the length of your training. Y'all listen to me. 
Those are devoted people. But when they're going through the training of it, many of them, the majority of them, the vast majority of them, do what is called ringing the bell. I quit. And it's not because they change their mind. It's not because they say, hey, I, I, I just don't want to do this anymore. It's because they hit the limit, they hit the wall, and they don't feel like they can go on any further. So they tap out, they ring the bell. Henry Cloud says they found the extent that their training has taken them. But that's what we find in what we call in our Christian cir circles faith. How many times have people, have, as we've gone through things the last few months, we found the end of ourselves, and we don't know and we don't understand and we can't go further. And so basically what we do is we tap out, we quit. We just, maybe we just said, I'm just going to push the button and pause and maybe later if things get back to normal, I, I don't want to get back to normal. I want to live a new normal. I want, to, I want to live with the power of Christ. Maybe we were getting put in this situation on purpose for such a time as this, that God could do an amazing work in our lives. If we can, Hebrews 11 says that we only please God by faith. Maybe God's looking for us to find our new level of faith that in the darkness of the moment we can see through and grab a hold of a holy God. And in the most simple terms we can say, okay then, all right. Lord, I believe, maybe even we'll be like that dad in the New Testament where he, he came and Jesus said, all things are possible to him who believes. And that man got real honest with Jesus and said, Lord, I believe. You remember the last part of it? Help thou my unbelief. You see, when I signed up for Christianity when I was 10 years old, I had no idea all the things that I was going to have to walk out. But I'm just as saved, I was just as saved then as I am today. But I've experienced so much more. I've had to trust him so much more. And I've seen him faithful so much more every step of the way. It says when he believed, it was counted to him. It was credited to him. The theological term is it was imputed to him for righteousness. When he said, Lord, all right, I believe. Lord, I'm going to live accordingly. God gave him his righteousness. When I was a 10-year-old boy, and I knew I had sinned, and I knew that that sin would separate me from my holy God, and I knew that God was calling me, I had to say, yes, Lord, yes. Come into my heart and save me. And when I did... He gave me all of his riches, all of his glory, all of his righteousness he gave to me. You see, standing before you, not a perfect person. You knew that already. Not that I've done everything right. Every week I blow it. Every week I mess up. Every week I wish I could have done something better. I'm not judged by that, though I am seen by that by some, but not by my father. When God looks at me, you know what he sees? He looks at me through the blood of Jesus Christ and he sees me cleansed, pure, and holy. Is that what y'all see? I'm born again. Not under sin, but in the righteousness of the goodness of God. Why would anybody not want such an exceedingly great reward? It's offered, it's there. It's possible. How far is your faith taking you? Faith is walking with God. Faith is abiding God. Faith is seeing through. It's seeing God's wonderful extended hand on the other side. Most of the people in this room have found that place where you didn't think you could go any further. Am I telling the truth? You face things that you never wanted to face. Hardship and pain. 
But most of you can testify. When you found that place, God was there. Richly blessing. So good. That's what he offers us. It's extended. All you have to do is from your heart to God's heart, you've got to believe. Let me read how Paul puts it in Romans chapter 10, verse number 8. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made into salvation. Where the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. There is no distinction between Jew and Greek. There's no difference between any of us. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord Say it with me. Shall be saved. I will not make it any more difficult than that. And if God called you that this is the road that you must pass through to have salvation, He can give you the faith to do it. If you so reach out and grab it and ask for it. Heads bowed. Eyes closed. If you've ever come to the place and time in your life that you know Jesus is Savior, you know Jesus is Lord, you knew that you had sinned and you asked Him to come into your heart and to cleanse you, to be your Savior and Lord. He, that is your testimony today, that He is the Lord of your life. Would you just raise your hand right where you are? You have asked Jesus to save you. you're here today and you can't say that God's speaking to your heart God's saying to you you need to be saved you need to act upon it you need to talk to the Lord repent of your sins tell him you believe in him that he came from heaven for you that he was born of the virgin that he lived a sinless life that he allowed them to take him and crucify him on the cross There he gave his life for your sins. He was dead. He was buried. But on Resurrection Sunday morning, he rose again for you to give you life. If you'll just tell him you believe in him and ask him to come into your heart and life and to save you, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you pray that prayer from your heart to God right now? Whether you're in this room, whether you're watching online, it's a simple prayer, and it can be prayed. Our Father, our God, we thank you for what you have done to make it possible for us. Lord, I pray that if there's someone here, someone watching online, that is feeling the drawing from from your spirit, to be saved, that they will be wise enough and that by faith they will ask you to save them. Come into their heart. Make them whole. Do for them what you did for me all those years ago. And sir, we'll praise you for it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Today we're going to do service a little differently. We're going to do the Lord's Supper. As a matter of fact, if there's anyone that has not been served, We're going to give you a moment to come up and receive this so that we can take it today.
Is there anyone here? Is everyone prepared? When we think of salvation, this is the picture that the Lord left us with. This is the meaning of it, the significance of it. He gave us the, what he gave those disciples that last night. And that they could uh, have the opportunity to be there with him. And as he gave him the bread, on our little thing, I know we're trying to do this a little differently. We're trying to do this the safe, healthy way. You'll find that there's a little place where you can pull it up and the little bread will be on top. You'll find the unleavened wafer there. Why is it unleavened? Because it has no leaven in it because it was representative of sin. So we have bread that shows the sinless body of Christ. The body that was broken. The body that was taken on the cross of Calvary. He took our shame. He bore our sins. And as he took the bread and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. So we need to understand that we have what we have because of the cross of Calvary. At the cross, everything changed for us. And we partake of his body broken for us in our salvation. Then he took a cup. And he had the, the juice, the wine that was in it, representing the blood that would be shed. I've thought about this quite a bit, as I'm sure you have too. When Christ was on that cross, his body beaten, he had been beaten all night long. Can you imagine his face so bruised and swollen? That crown of thorns that had been placed upon his brow, placed down, thorns an inch to two inches long. How often maybe the blood would run down his face through his eyes and drip off his nose. But in his heart and in his thoughts, he knew that that blood was doing a very significant thing. Today we take a, a symbol of it. But we understand that what we have in Christ was the perfect blood. The life, Scripture tells us, is in the blood. And he said to those in the upper room that night, this cup is the New Testament, the new covenant. He's reaching out to man to make a new deal a new opportunity in my blood. This do as often as you do in remembrance of me, the blood that makes it possible. At the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my soul was rolled away. It was there by faith I receive my sight. And what does it say? And now I'm happy all the day. Praise God for who he is to us and what he has done.